place along the atrium. And the stack grows from uh, the high, high end to the low end, and the heat goes from the low end to the high end. So if you, uh, so what is one example of uh, using a heat or dynamic uh, memory uh, space? Can you give an example? You guys use Java, right? Or even C++. You create objects at runtime. You get an input from the user, and the user wants to create hundred objects as a array of hundred objects, right? The hundred is an input given by the user. Uh, when this is allocated, you don't know how much space you want, right? Or how many objects you're going to create. At runtime, the user is specifying I'm going to create hundred objects. So all those hundred objects are to be stored in the dynamic portion of the process at space. If you want to create like 100,000 objects and there's no address space you exceed it, that's when you get the memory out of memory exception error and all those things. Okay? So if the heat eats up the stack, then the program slows down and eventually if uh, you cannot use the stack, you start getting problems So you run the program. And one use of the stack is to store what? Maybe this is all architecture things. Uh, what is one common use of a stack? I've heard of function calls, right? Uh, so we'll see more in the stack overflow, buffer overflow uh, chapter, but probably. Let's say we have a function A and you call a function B within A and then inside function B you call function C. Right? So when you call function B from A, you are not done with A yet. Right? So you want to call, uh, you want to execute function B and then after return from function B, you have to remember whatever you did in A and then you need to do some more things in A, right? So you have to remember about what is called the state information about that function A. So you cannot just uh, forget about that function A. So which means when you call function B, you have to store the state information about function A in memory. Okay? So that's where you use the stack. So stack operates according to what principle? First in, first out. Last in, first out, right? So, which means, which means, uh, if you go again according to this order, you should push details about A onto the stack, right? And then what you, what you should do? When B calls C, right, you are not yet done with B. So you should push information about B onto the stack. Right? right? And then you call C, so information about C should be on the stack. So when you are done with C, you return to B. So again you store critical information like return address and all those things which we will see later. So you need to know after you are done with C where you have to return. Right? So that's the return address. So you have to return to B. Similarly after you are done with B, you have to return to A. And after you're done with A, A, say the main function, you have to return the control of the operating system. Okay? So you have to store all these things in memory. Okay? So this is one use of a stack, or one very uh, common use of a stack. Okay? So, uh, any questions so far? Now what is this virtual memory? Who just told us? How many of you have taken uh, this comprehensive exam this fall on operating system to do? <coughs> if you don't know what is virtual memory and even the things I listed before, you should really get started at least. Right? You have heard of all these things, isn't it? Yeah, virtual memory is just a, a space. It's a software. I don't know, it's space. Well, it's an operating system that operates on, how can I put it? It's like, it's not the real deal. Right, it's like, it's like virtual. Of, yes. I mean, you know, 
It's, it's like an image of an operating system. It's an image of an operating system. I think you are. You have an idea, but let's do isn't it like, um, isn't it like space? These are things you cannot say I have to refresh, okay? When you go for interview or when you do it, these are the basic things they'll ask you. They won't ask you a very uh, particular uh, thing, okay? like Caesar site or Avengers. They won't ask all those. Okay. They'll ask only very general things, which you have to know anytime. Okay? All right. Now, look at this. Again, these are the five regions uh, of the process, right, that we just saw. A process thinks that it has all these five regions allocated consecutively in memory, in the main memory, in RAM. Okay? So whenever I say memory, it's a main memory, not the hard disk. Okay? Uh, but the main memory is limited in space. You are running several processes, and the operating system is also running on the main memory. It's stored, the code of the operating system is stored in the main memory. Right? So the user processes don't get much space in the memory. Okay? So some of the code, like for example, is the executable code of the process, this portion, right? or the data, or even the stack, or whatever, some of that could be stored in the hard drive. Okay? So which means, in reality, this could be how the main memory looks like. And I say actual memory, and I show two different colors, right? So the lighter one belongs to one process, and the darker one belongs to another process. So it need not be consecutively allocated for a process like this. And some of the portions actually are mapped. You see that? Some of, which means some of this, like three of this, are here in main memory, and two of this are actually in the hard drive. Right? So, which means the process, when it runs, it thinks that it has all these address spaces, right? It thinks that it has memory starting from here to here. But you see, it has only memory allocated in the main memory, only in this portion, right? So the rest is really what it perceives to be the memory available to it, or the address space available to it, but that's why it's virtual, it's not real, okay? It's actually that the memory is in the hard drive. The additional space, the additional code or whatever is not here, is stored in the hard drive. Okay? Is that clear now what is what I what they mean by virtual memory? Okay. So space. the process thinks that it has all this address space, but actually it doesn't have the entire address space. Okay? Some of its code or some of its data are stored in the hard drive when the process is in execution. Okay? So then what happens? If a process, if as a user you ask the process to do something and that information is not in the main memory, it's in the hard drive, you encounter what? You have to go read it. You have to go and get it, right? And if you have heard the call, a very uh, common term called page fault, right? That's what happens, okay? And we'll see that a little bit. Is, is that the same as um, swap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to. When it comes to that, if you require something from here, right, and the main memory is, say, full, you want to load something from here. So what do you have to do? We have to remove something from the main memory, put it in the virtual memory, and load what you want from the virtual memory to the main memory. So that's what you mean by swapping, that's what it is. Okay? Alright, so we'll uh, <coughs> probably come back to it a little bit after we finish this, okay? So, which means, uh, again, since we want to, we cannot store the entire, uh, what do you call, the image of the process consecutively like this, we have to break it down and store it in different memory locations, right? Because uh, you run one process, or run multiple processes, then stop a process, then start another process, and so on, right? So the memory space available to process is very unlikely to be continuously spaced like this. So even if all the entire main memory is available, you have to store the different contents in different locations of main memory. Because once you remove a process from the main memory, that space is not allocated. But uh, if a new process is started, the, uh, the space that the new, so this is say the available space from a process that you just terminated. But a new process may not fit in within that space. 
which means what? You have to store the different portions of the process in different space, uh, spaces available in the main memory, right? So you end up doing what is called the segmentation, or really like storing different portions in different portions of the main memory. And the segmentation is really a, a logical way of splitting a process address space into different segments. And one way of splitting a process address space into different segments is, say for example, if we have different functions like this, if you write a program with a main function and some other functions, you can put each function as a segment and store each in different locations. Okay? So that is a common way of splitting a program into different segments. Or if we have a huge array, the array itself could be a segment. Okay? So the data portion of the process will also be considered as a segment. Now, uh, with segmentation, it's a more logical way of looking at a program because you are not breaking a function and storing that as two separate segments. So a function is normally one logical module, okay? or an array is one logical unit. You store common elements like a set of all integers or set of all some real numbers, whatever. It's a logical unit. Okay? So that's why it's called a segment. Okay? And you could decide what uh, permissions the process can have on that segment. Because some segments, especially if you are running, uh, say, the DLL libraries and all those things, right? Or you develop, uh, you run a pro, you write a program, and you want that to be run by several other users, right? So you have certain permissions on that segment as a owner of that process. The other users who run your program may not have the same permissions on that segment. So segmentation, since it's a logical division of a process, helps you to set up access permissions on each segment. Okay? So from now on, you will see all these uh, symbols. Okay? R stands for read permission, W stands for write permission, X stands for execute permission. Okay? You might have seen this if you have done work on Unix systems, right? Read, write, execute permission. So for each segment, you can, as a owner or the operating system, can assign the permission uh, that the user has on that segment. Okay? Not the operating system assigns that permission. Okay? So if you're the owner, you have all permissions. If you're using somebody else's process or library, then you have limited permissions on that segment. And that's decided by the operating system. And the CGA and all these things are really nothing but the memory locations. As I said, the different segments are not stored consecutively. This is a logical way of looking at it. But actually, they are stored at different locations. So segment uh, A actually is a data segment. It's stored in edge. So it's stored somewhere here. So when you want to fetch something from there, from this data segment, you want to know what's called the offset, which means this edge is actually the starting memory address of that segment. So from that starting address, what address you really want to access. Okay? So if you want to access, say, the 10th element of an array, that 10 is the offset if the array is stored from the starting address. Okay? So when you try to try to access that segment, the operating system checks and makes sure you have the respective permission. For example, if you are trying to execute some portion of the segment and you don't have the execute permission, it will not let you to do that. So the operating system can check for permissions. Okay. And then try to complete this without paging, and then you can probably leave. So, um, so that is kind of advantage with segmentation. But what is the disadvantage of segmentation? As I said, if you clear up a space and or a segment, and you have another segment that you want to store in memory, if there's no sufficient space, you have to really look for another uh, portion of the memory where you can store the segment, right? Because segment as such cannot be fragmented, uh, cannot be broken further. You have to store the entire segment, like this is one full segment. You cannot split it up further with just pure segmentation. Okay? So which means it leads to fragmentation. As you store segments, remove segments and things like that, it leads to wastage of address space, which means as you, if you remove this and uh, you don't really need this space or all other segments are really bigger than this, then all the segments that you remove could not be used because 
it comes in a first in for first come first all basis. You use the spaces and you remove those segments and the future segments don't really fit with it here. You need some other other space then these spaces are just unused. Right? So that's called fragmentation problem. Okay? And one way people uh, try to do is sometimes you can have some software uh, run by operating system that tries to do what? Reallocate the segments or the other spaces so that you can gain some more memory, uh, like use, use of the latter space, right? One problem with doing that is, you see this table is called a segment translation table. So this segment translation table really stores where each segment is. This is the starting address of segment, the permissions you have, and the length and all those things. If you move around the segments with that program that tries to optimize the space, the segment translation table has to be changed because they're moving around the segments, right? So what is the new address of the segment, okay? So it comes with an overhead. You have to really change all the segment translation table, okay? So, and also, in addition to the segment translation table, if you have done some compiler stuff, you might have come across a term called linkage table. 